Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Words on Whiskey, episode 48. The 50 is approaching rapidly. Hope you had a great day. Fantastic weather out in Dublin today. Uh, hopefully the rest of the country was getting some of the same. I think we're in for a great week. And uh, we'll kick off this week. I, I want to just make a couple of announcements. I wanted to congratulate, firstly, Cal Byrne for making the final 10 of the... Uh, class world class bartender of the year awards so well done to him uh, he's part of the the blind pig setup and that's a great encouragement for our young bartenders and cocktail makers out there so congratulations again to cal burn and second announcement is the uh, tickets for belfast week ski week go back on sale tomorrow so that's promises to be really a fantastic event. We do have a small part to play in that. We have a tasting taking part in two Wednesdays time. That'll be kind of a collaboration between ourselves and the Belfast Whiskey Week and a surprise uh, announcement on that. But uh, in terms of surprises, it's no surprise who our next guest is. Uh, well known within the industry, he's been a, a huge proponent of Irish whiskey and in the hospitality trade for the last 17 years in Ireland anyway, and been part of the industry for 25 years. So uh, if anybody has any questions, of course, please do put them in the chat. We'd be delighted to, to answer any questions that you might have for our next guest. And our next guest, of course, is Michael Fogarty. Good evening. Good evening, Sergio. Good evening, everybody. Hello, how's everybody? Well, look, thank you very much for joining us. It's, uh, I know it's relatively busy time trying to get ready for opening up with the uh, new announcement that the pubs have been allowed to open up from, is it the 23rd? I'm not quite sure. I haven't actually checked the dates, but is, have they announced the date today, have they? I, 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 my understanding was the 23rd. I could be wrong on that, but uh, if anybody knows, maybe they can let us know in the chat. And uh, let's see, does anybody know? We shall find out soon enough. How does that affect you? Um, at the moment, it won't really because I don't believe we're planning on opening indoors. Okay. Uh, we have a fantastic beer garden out the back. Uh, we have some nice tables out in the front area. Uh, so that's you know more than enough for us at the moment. And it saves all the hassle of having a passport border control at the front door, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so you don't fancy doing the checks for for COVID passports or vaccinations, and no, I think it's going to be very difficult. Um, I, I won't even be. I'll just be allowed in myself because I got my second job yesterday. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you look yeah. young for me, I'm not going to let you in, am I? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But I mean, uh, it's been a, a, an interesting year to say to say that mildly. But uh, how have you managed to to survive within the last year? I, I, I know there's been a big shift from where you've been and um, you've pivoted really dramatically um, to yeah. take advantage of the online presence. Yeah, so both businesses have changed very rapidly. Obviously, when this all started back in March, we had plans running through pretty much to the end of March into April with some sort of in-person whiskey tastings that we had done in the, in the, the shop floor, in the, the whiskey shop. And uh, so we had all the, a lot of whiskey purchased for that. So when, when we, we shut down, it was like, oh, I have all this whiskey. I know where to get many bottles. Let's just move it online. So I think our, the first event, I got in touch with the person who was going to be organising that with me. It was, it was Paul Tohill from uh, Glen Moranji Arbeck in Ireland. Yeah. And it was like, uh, instead of doing it in person, I have all these whiskeys here. Can we do it online? Let's move it online. I'll send it out in the post and sell tickets online and we'll see what happens. So that was that. That went really well. And then you know, it sold out quite quickly. And then we just went on a bit of a roll. And I think we done you know, the next one was out like it was a really easy one to do. We had lots of space side whiskey. So yeah. we called Spay at Home because it was a bit of a pun on stay at home. And I think that sold out in 10 minutes. And then it was just, just went bananas after that because everyone's looking for things to do. And yeah. we've grown that, that into that space quite well, you know, since last March. And just really, really developed it, and it's it's been fantastic, and it's actually excellent because you know we've done shop tastings and person tastings, we've had capacity of thirty people. Yeah, 
now we've seen up to 250 people online with us all over the country. So, you know, it's it's actually broadened our market. We've introduced more people into our events from all over the country, uh, even into Europe and America with these tastings. So it's been it's been great that way um, because not everybody can get to Dublin, you know. But yeah, no, of course. Yeah. So you brought, I mean, you broaden, you broaden the audience and you broaden the selection as well that way, I guess. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's been, it's, and it's 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 been great. I I love I love doing it. It's like I always say that whiskey is about having fun. Yeah, uh, you know, so having fun online and drinking whiskey and chatting to guests very similar to this. Yeah, uh, and just having fun and enjoying ourselves, and it's been great. And then the pub sort of pivoted to doing like clicking collection and doing things like that. And yeah. then I had you know there's a few false dawns last year, opening, closing, opening, closing, which was, you know, you'd rather just be stay closed and be done with it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess the whole industry has really had to pivot and so much has moved online. So, I mean, the store is still open online, uh, lmulliganwhiskeyshop.com, and people can get their tasting packs from there as well? Yeah, everything's there. We've actually nothing in the pipeline. I do have plans, and but uh, it's such good weather and people taking staycations and whatnot, we sort of just held back a little bit, but we're We'll restart again in a couple of weeks. We've got some really good ones coming up. We want to do like a blending experience and send you a blending pack and we'll, you know, we'll get you to make your own blended yeah, Irish yeah. whiskies or Scotch whiskies, blended malt. And you know, the sky's the limit with that, you know, what, based on what we can send out to you. And we'll just have a bit of fun making, yeah. making some whiskies, you know. Yeah, I have to say I enjoyed the uh, Ireland versus Australia one that we were part of. That was uh, with Marcus. So that was really interesting. But, I mean, there's been so many that normally you just would not, it's not so much that you might not get to try, you might not get to try them side by side. That's the thing as well. Yeah. You know, so I think that that's what we've tried to do. Like the one you mentioned there, the Scotland, sorry, Ireland, the Australia one. Again, it's about having fun. Three Australian whiskies and three Irish whiskies. And yeah. just having a bit of fun on the night and comparing, you know, it's very hard to compare like from like, but it was a bit of fun on the night. And, and that's what that's what I like how our, our tastings are about. It's having fun and just, cheering yeah. that everybody else and in fact it was actually very funny uh, one of the whiskey companies that we used in australia we done that tasting i think back last june sir just is it that long wow and one of them one of the australian whiskey companies got in touch with us in march looking for a rematch <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay well i'd be on for that they weren't there on the night you know so we were yeah. trying to do something like that logistically because my business partner sean he's in australia at the moment very close to where that distillery is yeah trying to organize something that the time difference makes it a little bit trickier unfortunately yeah and i think she's just uh finished up her dissertation as well for qualifications isn't it D a dissertation is that, that is that a thing where you've thought about twenty thousand words on a subject yes yeah yeah so there we've we'll got the two scotsmen we've got liam and we've got kevin o'connell on now as well I think, i'm sure you know liam i do liam um, urban bar Good uh, evening, all. I think I know him virtually more than, uh, than... Well, that's the thing. I mean, we've opened up a lot of doors virtually in terms of uh, who you get to know. So, look, obviously people know you from the El Mulligan bar and the El Mulligan shop, but you've been on the whiskey scene for a very long time. But I guess prior to coming over to Ireland, and I know you came over early 2000, 2003, 2004, but... Yeah, Obviously, you're a Scotsman originally. Tell us a little bit about where you're from and your growing up background and how you got into whiskey. So I'm from the I'm the, I'm from the city of Desperate Dan and Dennis the Menace. Yeah, he, Dundee. And um, so yeah, I, I I grew up in, in Dundee as a child, uh, pretty much. If anyone knows Dundee, it's flanked by the on the the east by a town called Broughty Ferry and on the west called Invergowrie, near the posh areas of Dundee. Everything else in the middle is pretty much a housing estate. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, grew up on a, I grew up on a council housing estate in Dundee, uh, you know, and then these areas started to go downhill very rapidly, I suppose, in the late 80s, early 90s, as certain uh, illegal substances became readily available. So my mother made a, and it got us out of there, essentially, and we moved to a farm, uh, actually just outside of Dundee and we lived there for a long long time and yeah. I grew up there and uh yeah and uh, the whiskey thing and I, I remember like my mother's friend had a bed and breakfast in the town of Aberfeldy which is about 50 miles away and we used to yeah. go and 
there many lots of summers uh, and and any time off my mother had, I would go up there and she'd help out her friend Ben breakfast and you know there'd be this lovely campsite we stayed in and there was a lovely play park. I remember there was a golf course like a, what was it putting green and so there was lots to do as, as a child there. And but I remember my mother's friend would like drinking whiskey, so we went and visited the Aberfeldy distillery and I think I was about. 12 years old at the time and I was there and I was just blown away by the size of these massive copper pot fills. Yeah. And I started fishing for information and then it sort of defined my high school education. Um, so when you start selecting what subjects you're going to carry through into your your third, fourth and fifth and sixth years at, at, at school, I, I was looking at chemistry, maths and physics as these subjects because I wanted to go, I wanted to go and study chemical engineering. At All the techie subjects. Yeah, I wanted to study chemical engineering because I wanted to um, I wanted to become a distiller, you know. Yeah. So, so basically, I was I was planted in as, as a seed from a very young age, and then I got to I got to university uh, in Newcastle, and I was doing chemical engineering down there. And then that's when I found the other enjoyment of whiskey. <laughs> and, uh, I was actually like to drink it at that stage. Yeah, I think we all did that. Yeah. <laughs> We all did that at some point. Yeah, I mean, what was it that captured you? What was the attraction then, I suppose, when you first went into Aberfell Distillery? I'd never seen anything like that before, you know, and this is, so this is, when is this, what, 1990? Um, so the whiskey tours weren't really a thing, you know, back then. Um, yeah. I, I remember we were the only people on the tour and it was the height of summer. And so I, I think it was more or less, you just rocked up and they took you around and it wasn't, if you go to the Aberfeldy now, you pretty much get one of these handheld walkie-talkie guides that talk you through it and tell you. Oh you yeah, know. it's called the Jewers World of Whiskey. It's all about the Jewers blend. And yeah. fact, you got basically got access all areas. You got taken to everything. You were not going to be walking around. It was a big industrial. Imagine as a kid walking around now. You've never been in that before. It was just. But amazing. I mean, you grew up in a very industrial town, so I mean. Yeah, yeah. Dun Dundee is a very industrial town, and you know, but. I, I never really seen any of that, I suppose, you know. I wasn't, you know, my, 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 I wasn't a child slave. I wasn't sent off to the factory to go work in, you know. <laughs> to be honest, like 30, 40 years before my time in Dundee, that would have happened. Um, oh, know, yeah. The jute mills there, you know, you would have you'd been sent to the jute mill as a child, you know. To yeah. Answer. Um, was that, that was the three J's of Dundee, jute, jam, and journalism, you know. Right. Uh, it's, now been, it's now been substituted to, what is it, uh, journalism jamming junkies you know um, well I, I think liam liam speaks very highly of dundee now has uh been very much rejuvenated yeah it has um, i haven't been there for well, obviously a couple of years now at this stage but they redone the whole waterfront area they've built a, a victoria and albert museum uh, we have a, a an, an absolute fantastic boat there the from i think it's uh, scott's uh, explorations of the antarctic and yeah. um, I do believe the Eden Project, based in Cornwall, are now looking at transforming an old gas works in Dundee and putting something more on the map. And there's, there's there is a lot of positives going on in Dundee and happening there, and it's great. You know, we get a lot of the golf tour tourism from St Andrews because we're only what 15, 20 miles away from St Andrews. So big weekend, of course, this weekend for them. Uh, the British yeah. Open. Yeah. yeah. That's I think that's in England this year, isn't it? Is that St. George's? It's St. George's this year, yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Well, uh, when when things like that, and I remember, like, you know, uh, the Carnoustie Golf Club is also down the road, but there's been an open there as well. Uh, and my, my, one of my uncles on my mother's side actually lived across the road from the golf course there for many right. years. Um, so golf's quite, in, in, it's quite uh, you know, it's probably more important than whiskey in our area. But Dundee's not really a, a whiskey sort of town. You know, whiskey is pretty much, well, it's not made in the city, it's pretty much bar, say, Auchintosh and Glasgow. And yeah. Or more out, you know, we're quite far away, you know. Whiskey's quite popular on the West Coast and the islands and, and the highlands and Speyside. Uh, you know, the area around Dundee is phenomenal farming land. So we, we grow amazing barley. So we probably were involved in it that way more than anything because we do have a great farmland around that area. Yeah. And were you surrounded by whiskey growing up like in terms of, was it in the house? Was it something that... No. Or, or was it more the the industry that captured your imagination and the machinery yeah. and the equipment? There was never balls of whiskey in our house. It never happened. Uh, we, in fact, we don't think we had. I see. I don't think we had a lot of drink in the house. My family were very much uh, social people and going out. Yeah. To, you know, the pubs and 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 in Dundee, like working men's clubs and things like that, social clubs at the time. 
They're yeah. very much like that. In fact, my grandfather ran one of these working men's social clubs for about 40 years. Right. Um, so that was pretty much so a lot of this, the family socializing was done out out of the house. Yes. Uh, like, like that. So there was never really alcohol in the house. So it wasn't like I grew up around I I don't have any of these bad experiences when I was like 15 or 16 raiding the drinks cabinets. I never I never had I actually never had my first beer uh, until I was actually 17 when I went to university. Um, wow. I had the first drink with the father when I was 18 and all that, but I wasn't gallivanting around because we moved away from this sort of uh, yeah. uh, council housing estate. I think my mother got us away from that, and so we didn't flip into any of that, you know? I mean, was it rough like you would see in, uh, I suppose, if you take your train spotting m movie, was life like that in Dundee? It was, you, you know, the, even, at, even at the age of like 10, 11, 12 years, you had to, you had to stand up for yourself, you know? You had to... You yeah. had to watch. So I, I remember, I actually remember, what was, I think this is what broke the camel's back from my mother, is our house got burgled. And, uh, we, you know, we all, myself and my sister had a small TV, and like one of these 14-inch portable TVs in our bedrooms each. Yeah. And, I don't know, computer, games, console, or whatever. Yeah. And we, we knew who burgled it. It was our next-door neighbor. Oh, God. Yeah. When, when your next-door neighbor's breaking into your house, because he knows you're not there, because he's got a drug problem. Yeah. But, Long, you know. So I, I remember, but yeah. And unfortunately, there's still small areas of Dundee like that, but there's small areas like that in every city, everywhere in the world. And absolutely, yeah. We get, you know, we can only give them as much support as we can to move on from that. So, so you were smitten by the by the distillery, and you decided you want to try and get into to be a distiller. So, what you, you did? You finish school? You finish school, and then. Yeah, I finished you know, quite good grades and whatnot and got a place at University of the, uh, Northumbria in Newcastle. The University of Northumbria at Newcastle. It's a, one of these old polytechnics that changed into a university back in the day when that was happening. Yes. Yeah. I went down there and studied down there and I really enjoyed it. At the same time, I got, a, I got a job in a bar collecting glasses. It's quite strange. You can't go work behind a bar until you're 18. I yes. actually moved to university. I went to university when I was 17 and a half in the September. And I wasn't 18 till the following March. Um, but so I couldn't work in a bar pouring pints, but I could collect glasses. So I was a, as a glass collector in a pub on yeah. Friday, Saturday nights. And that was like substitute, substitute of the income. Now, yeah. I couldn't pour pints in the pubs, but I can certainly go drink them because I was six feet yeah. tall, you know, yeah. so it was very easy to get served anywhere. Um, so I'd, I'd done a lot of that. Um, but I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that buzz of working in hospitality. Yes. I, I knew that. So when I came back for the summer break, I ended up getting a job in a pub in, in the local area, and I was working there, and I really enjoyed it. And I, I had to make a decision, and I was like, you know, I probably went to I probably went to university a year too early, in fairness. Yeah, 17 is young to be going, in fairness, yeah. And uh, I, I wanted to make a decision, like, what was I doing with myself? I really liked this, the technical side and wanted to be a distiller, but I really loved this, this hospitality industry, and... I sort of says, well, there's, there's sort of two, two, two ways of whiskey. I looked at whiskey back then as there's two ways, and I still do now. Uh, you either make it or you sell it. So you're, in, you're involved in production or sales. That's mm -hmm. essentially if you break whiskey down to two jobs, you know, yeah. you fall into one of these categories. So I looked at it as the hospitality side of things. was like, that's the sales side of things. You could be selling whiskey. And I fell into that. And that, you know, and, and then I, had, I made this decision in the summer that, I wasn't returning to university. So I think that I was an 18-year-old. I must be the only 18-year-old that got a belt off his mother. Right. Uh, not going back to university because I think my mother was extremely proud of me of actually getting to university in the first place because I was quite clever as a youngster and um, I didn't go to the run-the-mill sort of secondary school. My mother put me forward for an exam uh, to get a scholarship to the high school of Dundee, which is a fee-paid school in Dundee. And yeah. I got a scholarship to go there. Which I was extremely proud of that. So when you back at the university, that was uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a hard huge person. achievement. Yeah, um, but no, I I I got involved in the hospitality industry. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I ended up I went to go to I went to Jersey in the Channel Islands shortly after that, and uh, I went there for a week's holiday to see a friend, and never came back. Really, and, you stayed out there? Yeah, I I went for a job interview on a Thursday. And in, in a pub, and the guy in the pub says, so uh, when do you need to know by? I says, well, I'm getting the boat back tomorrow night. <laughs> and he says, I sure, he says, I'll tell you what, he says, he says, coming for a trial on Saturday. And he says, if you're any rubbish, if you're rubbish, I'll give you the money to get the boat back anyway. 
So right. yeah, you need to move So anyway, so I went and I went to work there on the Saturday, and it was a twelve till nine shift. Never had a break. It turns out it was the busiest day of the year in the town of Gorey in Jersey because it was the Gorey Fit. So everybody descended on the area, and it was just six deep at the bar for nine hours. I never had a break. And uh, when I finished, uh, the owner called me over and says, "Can I buy you a beer?" And I went, "Yeah, sure." And his wife looked on in horror, and because uh, the, the owner of the pub, uh, he was called Michael as well, actually was legendary for never buying staff a pint. Never All right. A pint. So I sort of knew there and then that I was sorted for a job, and uh, I stayed there and had a, a really good time and learned a lot, a lot, a lot about management and a lot about seller work and things and cash scales and. You know, lots of all aspects of the trade. He was he was an amazing teacher, and I very quickly got uh, moved on to another pub and became a manager. Literally within months, and became a manager. in Jersey. Yeah, and I think it was only what 21, 21 at the time. Yeah, uh, and became a manager of a pub, and then I was very lucky in that pub. Um, there was a load of whiskey behind the bar, and I knew quite a lot. I knew all the brands. I knew everything about them. I just I hadn't. I drank some of them, and yeah. the actual owners were wanting to get rid of these whiskeys because they couldn't sell them. So they said, yeah, you like whiskey, you know about it, get rid of it. I sold so much of it, we had to order more. And then okay. that, that sort of whole other affair of selling whiskey in a hospitality setting came around and really sort of pushed on from that, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, where did you get the sales bug from? Is that something from your mother's side or family side? Or no, you just? I don't know. I think I'm the black sheep of the family. I really am. Uh, I don't, none of us, none of the family been in sales. My mother was a chef. Uh, my father said various jobs, a little bit of sales at times, and but um, you know, but I, I wouldn't say it was in the body. It was just, I think, I like talking to people and, and chatting to people. And I think if you're at ease talking to people, it's very easy to work in a bar or a restaurant because it's a, there's a natural vibe that customer comes in. You've got to talk to them. Yeah. If you, if you just look silently at the customer, and the customer looks silently at you, nothing's going to happen. You know? Yeah. No. Well, never... to, you know, here's a beer. You know. And yeah. you know, some whiskeys, and you know, if you're serving food and having meals and whatnot, you may like a whiskey after your meal, that sort of thing. And I think that's how I just, it just, it just fell into it, really. You know, just this is okay. This this feels natural. Yeah. And it's, it's been, it's just been a human being. Who's, you know, as my grandfather always said, manners cost nothing. Yeah, you know? but I mean, it's people like yourself that I really empathise with because you know, during this lockdown, I mean, that's the biggest factor that's missing is the human contact and human interaction i mean do you do you miss that or has has online made up for it online online's great and i've had, I've had a lot of fun online and it's great you know there's i can see the people in the chat as well i've seen them on my events and they've had some really good fun and some great nights together and just shoot the breeze about whiskey you know yeah uh, all that sort of stuff but um I, yeah i do miss i know i was working in the, the pub last last saturday saturday past there um, and it's my, my first time in, in a few years. And I, I was a little bit nervous because of, you know, learning, learning ropes again. And I, yeah. remember, but I just had this really, really nice moment on Saturday evening, you know, a, a family of five, their mother and father and three children come in and they're having a meal and then they move to outside and they're sitting outside and uh, the father's drinking Buna Haven. He's got had a whiskey recommendation. That's great. The, the mother orders a cup of tea. And I bring out a cup of tea to her, and one of the children say, "Ah, oh, mother, mum, there's no, uh, there's no cookie with that. There's no biscuit with that." And the mother says, "Oh, you only get that with the coffee." So there's three children there, so I go back inside and I pick up three cookies and bring them out and give them to the children. That's just, isn't it? that's just, that's just nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they'll remember that as well. You know, it doesn't take much to do it, but it's thoughtful all the same. It's that's that human contact that we're missing in in the pub, you know. Yeah. It's, it's simple things like Sergio, you were you were spectacles. You go into the pub in the rain, a barman yeah. automatic hands you a napkin for your spectacles to dry them off. Yeah, it's as much as we miss and we don't and, and we don't realise until we we're actually not got them. You know. Yeah. No, it's it's very true. I'm looking forward to actually proper normal interaction and um, the online is great. I mean, it opens doors. There's no doubt about that. You know, it opens uh, doors to try new things, but. Uh, you do miss yeah. the human element. I do miss the human. I, I think. I think we'll. I think we'll probably go to a hybrid model. Really. Yeah. You know, I think, and I said that's what our plan would be like if we start doing in-person tastings again in the pub. I'd like to stream them live online because there's a lot of people out with Dublin joining our tastings, you know, all over the country. So you know, our, sure. 
even on outlying areas of, Dun uh, of Dublin, you know, say them traveling in, getting buses and taxis to come to an event, you know, there's still the opportunity to join in from your from your lounge, you know. Whether yeah, well, I mean, that's the one thing that surprised me is uh, you got a very worldwide audience uh, when you were doing them. You had people from the States, from Australia, Asia, all over the place, uh, South America, you know, um, an audience that you wouldn't normally get. We were very lucky because it just it just rolled off, rolled into something for us. We we cancelled one event and moved it online. Yeah. So we, we didn't. There was no like thinking around humming in hand. Will we do this or will we won't? And you know, and then word got out. People were talking. It was on socials and whatnot. So more people joined the mailing list. The mailing list gets bigger, and it just spreads from there. And you know, and it, it just went really well. And you know. Yeah. And I, it was, it was, sometimes it's really hard because you'd sell 120 tickets and you'd have another 120 emails looking for a ticket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you've got to pack them and fulfill them, which is uh, that, a nightmare that, as well. That was quite difficult in the beginning. Uh, it really was extremely difficult um, because you know, there's, there's one of the bottles there. Uh, yeah. Filling, filling is quite easy. Um, the hardest part is this, is the screw cap. Uh, yeah. if, you, if you've like uh, 1,500 of them go out a week and you've got a full hand, yeah, well, you have I, to get gloves. I had I had blisters and calluses over my fingers for the first few months, but I have a tool on my desk now. I don't. I think it's here actually. Let's see if I can pull it out and show you. Um, it's essentially it's not it's not switched on, but you oh, where are we now? We just all right. It's like a drill. Yeah, you yeah. Press the button and it screws the cap on for you. Yeah, uh, that, that that was the best investment, best hundred euro I've ever spent in my life, um, because it screwed all the clip down. So that made the, the process a lot easier. I'll say nothing about you spending a hundred euro. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rarity. But look, uh, obviously you, you spent how long did you end up spending in in Jersey then? Overall, uh, it's probably about four years. Yeah, I, I, I rose quite quickly in the hospitality trade over there uh, into sort of manager sort of relief management for other bars moving around worked for the Miriam brewery and in, in the end and so I, I got a lot i got gained a lot of experiences of different bars in different yeah. settings you know uh, which was excellent there's people now talking about their first uh, their first tastings so jonathan ramirez you know i mean they definitely developed a, a reputation the tastings they did and some of them grew to be to be huge yeah, I think I think we don't take them seriously. Let's be honest. It's all about having fun. You yeah, know, I've, I've I've said this. Earlier. I come from the mentality that you know drinking whiskey is about fun. It's about having fun. Alcohol is yeah. having fun. It's it's it's, it's downtime. It's time out of, out of your working day to sit down. It's to relax, have a beer, have a whiskey. If you can't enjoy that, you should not be drinking alcohol. Yeah. You know? and, I had to got too nerdy. Has whiskey tasting got too nerdy? Are there people no, that are? No, I think it's gone the other way. Uh, I remember like, when I first moved here, what, I was 25, 26 year old. I'm a little older, actually. <clears throat> and it's very hard to get a foot in anywhere. I was too young. People was like, get him out of the way. You know, it was very, it was still an old man's game. Yeah. And, uh, so I think it's gone the other way. You know, there's, there's, there's lots of young people getting involved in whiskey and, and all, all race, all genders, all ages. And whiskey's for everybody, you yeah. know. And that has always been, and we've always promoted as well. Um, and and by having that, you sort of, I don't mean, I don't want to sound bad, but you stamp out that nerdiness. You yeah. know, if you're getting too nerdy, then you know you, you need to you need to take a, a step back, because at yeah. the end of the day, it's it's a whiskey, it's a drink. You should enjoy it, have fun drinking it, share your thoughts with other people, or by all means. But uh, you know, we've all we've all gone through the stages where we've we've um, we've been we've been tasting we we're tasting notes, pencil shavings and oh yes, licking, yeah. licking, licking the inside of a boot, you know. <laughs> and sometimes you have to go, hang on here, you know. Yeah. It's a lovely drink. Yes, I'm just getting all these lovely flavors, and I'm enjoying this, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you don't like it, that's fine. Another man. One man's bad whiskey is another man's good whiskey, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there's a uh, whiskey for everybody, as they say. But, I mean, what was it in particular? You know, you spent four years in Jersey there managing a bar. What did you What did you learn there that became useful later on in your career? Uh, managing people. 
Uh, although I, I never got that right, actually. I'll, I'll tell you why. I learned how to do it. I just never implemented it. <laughs> right, okay. Um, you, you'll never manage human beings. Uh, human beings are a complete different species. To, you know, it's just everyone's different. It's brilliant. Uh, just th things that are around the hospitality industry, stock control, you know, figures, pricing, you know. Um, yeah. And, and when to have the difficult conversation when someone's had too many, too much to drink, and how to do that in such a friendly way that they leave on your terms, and yes. then when you come back the next day, you're still your best friend. Yeah. You know, life skills. I learned a lot of life skills. You know, as a, as a young twenty year old and venturing out in the world, you might not know a lot of things. You yeah. know, and so you need you need other adults around you to tell you and guide you. You know. Yeah, but I like you, you. You learn by doing, and you learn by seeing as well. Um, and I guess having those people's skills is going to stand to you know, in any in any walk of life, I guess, not just in the hospitality side, but um, understand. But I'm sure I'm sure you. There's not much you haven't seen going on in a bar. <laughs> some of them which we probably could talk about, and some of them which we probably can't. But you know. Yeah, I, I, I've seen I've seen some great things and I've seen some horrific things. You know, um, mm -hmm. these things happen. I, I, I once had a bare chested man come up to me behind the bar in in Jersey, and, and he he was he was actually from Glasgow, and he, he just wanted to fight. And it was like I was very lucky that the one of the owners walked in at the time and basically stood me down. Otherwise, I was going to give him a fight. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, you're, a tall, you're a tall man. You're not going to give in easily, I suppose. Yeah, no, I, I won't. You know, I won't back down to anybody. You know, if I take a beating, I'll take a beating. But <laughs> yeah. for, thankfully, that's not really happened. But you know, yeah, um, yeah I've, I've seen, I've, but I've seen some great things. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen things, and especially millions uh, on Valentine's Day proposals. And all right, okay, yeah, I'm sure. We'd have a we'd have a bit of fun in the restaurant on Valentine's Day, and like you know. We'd have a sweepstakes, and each member of staff would get a table, and you put a fiver in the hat, and whatever table made the pro proposition first, you won the sweepstakes. You know? Okay, you're guaranteed one's going to happen anyway, I guess. Yeah. You can have fun and, and make make the night a bit more enjoyable, you know. Yeah, but I mean, one of the things people forget is that it's a it's a tough life, Michael. I mean, it's long hours, it's difficult hours. Sometimes you have complaining customers, difficult customers. Uh, how do you? How does that bear down on you over time? Uh, it, it can be difficult. I mean, every situation has a resolution, you know. So you have to look at that, and you just have to, you know. Sometimes you have to take a, back, a step back from a situation, think about it, and then move on it and act on it and in the right way. Everything mm -hmm. has a solution, you know, and a proper solution. Uh, so you know that that's 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 and it's very difficult to to handle at the time, but. If you take a step back and think about the, the, the difficulties, hours, you know, if you get into this industry and you enjoy this industry, hours are part of the parcel. You made that decision, yeah. You know? um, so yeah, there's a lot of weekend work and whatnot, nighttime work. But you know, yeah. if you if you choose to be a milkman, you get up early in the morning. You know, that's true. You know? Yeah, you make your bed and lie in it, I guess. Yeah, so there's you know that's the job you choose, and I, I chose hospitality, hospital, you know. So that's it. So as soon as you make that choice, you know what you're getting into. Yeah. You know, yeah. you shouldn't be forced. If, you, if it's you can't, you can't really force them to doing a job, so you, know, you find a job that suits you. And tell me, was it was it always whiskey that was the your main love in in terms of what's behind the bar, or was it everything? Uh, so when I moved to Dublin, I got a bit of a free hand on a bar there. When I moved over here, uh, I really got a free hand because I moved. When I, I moved here, it was like a, I think it was the, it was a week before my birthday. So I'm, you know, I, I think I, I, I came via Munich because I went to to Munich to watch an Arsenal match, and yes. we, got, we, we got beat five one. So the next morning, I was in Dublin, and immediately got down to whatever it's I don't know how, what it's called these days, what, the the job centre, the entry centre, whatever it is. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I started buying newspapers with the job and went started going through all the small lands looking for jobs. And then I was interviewing within the next day. And I had to pick a four jobs within the next day. And I, I, I chose the lowest paid one. <laughs> you chose the worst paid one? Yeah, I, cho I chose the one with the least amount of money uh, at the time. But I seen the potential and what right. I could put my stamp on. Or I could have took the one with the best money and I could just be slinging out pints for fun. Yeah. I'm not my crack, but you know, I was looking for something that gave me a little bit 
Um, Brooks Hotel had this lovely blank canvas, this amazing, beautiful bar, uh, not much behind it, in fairness. Lovely yeah. glass shelves that were empty. And so the, the, the first thing they wanted me to do was sort of get some cocktails going. So mm -hmm. cocktail kind of thing. So I think that the first cocktail menu I wrote for the, the bar was the worst cocktail menu I'd ever written in my life. But it was actually getting all the old produce out of the bar. Okay. So if, you've any, got any, if anyone's got any blue curacao at home and they can't get rid of it, just give me a call because I can make loads of cocktails out of that to get rid of it. The blue liqueur, yeah. Gosh. There's plenty of that behind the bar. So it's just moving stuff out and then re restocking and getting it to, into some nice drinks and nice drinks menu in the cocktail side of things. And then uh, Celtic Whiskey Shop was just around the corner. So that was that was like a sweet shop for me. They were supplying to the trade. So we worked together and we, I started, I think I put in, I, I got 15 bottles of whiskey in that were Scottish. I had the basics there, Jameson, Paddy, Powers, Bushmills at the time. Yeah. Uh, so I got 15 Scotch and it was coming from the Scotch angle. They sold really well, and the deal I had: if you sold the bottle, you can replace it and get another one, another brand. So I okay. built, I built up the collection that way. So I developed about twenty scots at the time. Then started getting in, you know, the green spots, the red spot, uh, the red breasts, and getting them in the bar, and starting building that small portfolio of Irish whiskey at the time that was available and it's slightly more premium. And built the scotch again, and just kept building. It. And I think we got to about a hundred, hundred whiskeys. Then we started getting noticed and winning awards for that in the, in the, the hotel bar. Yeah, um, and then yeah, I was getting a bit more noticed out there. The cocktails were doing really well. We got some really good feedback, and some we got a massive write up in Lonely Planet at the time about them. So I was doing as I, 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 I broadened my horizons on spirits from whiskey into rum, gins, and all sorts. You know, and how yeah. to how to bring them together to make nice drinks as well. And was it a difficult sale getting scotch into the hotel or getting scotch sold into Ireland? Uh, no, it was actually quite easy. It was, it's probably the easiest place to put Scotch whiskey in because they've got loads of visitors. So they already yeah. know Scotch. So at the time, you know, this is like, what, 2004, 2005, there wasn't many Irish whiskey brands around. No, um, it was still quiet, yeah. And those that were around were the big boys like Jameson. Jameson were stateside. So the Americans that were coming over knew Jameson. Mm. But they knew, they, they knew Lagavu and Talisker, Oban and all them brands a lot more. So when they see them on the back bar, they felt comfortable as well. I mean, there's a product they knew and they can order. And then you'd use that and maybe get them to try an Irish whiskey. You know, they'd have a scotch. They'd be there for a few nights and, you know, frequenting the bar. Try this, try that. So you, you bring them into the Irish whiskey scene a little bit that way. So it was actually quite easy. I, I, I used that as a tool uh, yeah. to get – to get yeah. so then – so it was a hotel bar and it did sort of take, have a lot of focus on its hotel guests – However, at the same time, then the Shelburne shut down for refurb. Yeah. You had all these high and mighty people with loads of money who, and their favourite hotel bar was closed. So they just all spilled out into all the surrounding hotel bars. And we went into this banana situation where I think Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, you just couldn't get in the door. Uh, yeah. And we were, we were selling everything, whiskies, cocktails, wines, champagnes. And that's when I got my first taste of the, the Celtic Tiger. And how, how stupid people were month with money were. You know, you, you'd come to the bar and buy an 80 euro bottle of champagne, hand 100 euro to you and say, keep the change. Thank you very much. I'll keep the change. But the stupidity of it, that's no way to tip a bartender. That's way too much. You know, yeah. you know, in, in, in Ireland, maybe in America, in the tipping culture is a bit different. You know, I've, all, all I've done is gave you two glasses and popped a champagne cork. You know, I don't need 20 quid for it. You know, someone's yeah. paying for that. They were strange times. I remember them, but yeah, we all did crazy things during that time. So I could, I was able to at that time. I could make a week's wage in one night on tips. Right. It, was, it was just stupid. And I, I, I watched this happen, and I know this is wrong. There's some this this is going to spectacularly go wrong here. Yeah, and, and it, well, obviously it did. But then I, I was doing well, and the, the bar was busy. And it was great, and it was, I was getting a lot of feedback and lots of people and. I always say a sign of a, a good bar is when you see other bartenders come along to drink in your place and see what's going on. And yeah. you see quite a bit of that as well. So I've built some friends up in, within the industry as well. And then, and then I moved to, and I, I, I'd say, well, not so much headhunted, but not near, near enough to, to Celtic Whiskey Shop. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that was sort of a natural fruit. I love whiskey and I like selling it. So I was just selling it by the bottle instead of by the measure at this stage. Yeah, how different is that? 
I mean, it, I would imagine it's quite a different skill set. Uh, even in how you interact with your your customer is going to be very different to somebody dropping in off the street and buying a bottle yeah. to take away. Yeah, I I almost found that. And I think I, I built up a relationship with the guys in Celtic Whiskey Shop at the time and prior to working there. That you know, if you if you're looking to buy a hundred euro whiskey, you may not want to buy it straight away. You want to try it first. So they they'd send people around to the hotel bar. So we'll go around there. Here's it on the shelf. You can try it there at such and such price. And if yeah. you like, I send the back round. You know, there was no in cahoots on commissions or anything like that. It was just it was a nice thing to do. You know, yes. yeah, for the customer. So there was always that. If people were apprehensive for buying stuff, go and go to a whiskey bar and try it there first. Mm-hmm. And if you like it, come and buy it. Because you'll never get them decisions always right. You could recommend. People can tell you what they like in flavors, and you can recommend that. You hope that 90% of the time you get that right. But there's going to be there's going to be incidents in, in, in where you just, you just didn't like it. Yeah. So, you know, I think the, the staff in whiskey shops, Celtic, ourselves, Foxes in, in Dublin, and any whiskey shop around the world, they're, they're, they're fantastic. You know, give them a few, give them a few sort of buzzwords that you like, and they'll mm-hmm. help you out there. So, you know, it's it's a two-way conversation. You've got to have the conversation. You know, I I, I don't believe in like someone. And I'd be joke about it. I tell you, in the industry, people come with a hundred euro, but you're going to sell them a hundred fifty euro bottle of whiskey. Mm-hmm. Doing that. People feel cheated, and you know, if you think about it. You, know, you work with the work with the budget the person's got, you know, and not try to oversell them. You know, there's no point. We're not, yeah. or, you know, as people. Say, I think we're them. quite good at that now, though. I I do think we're good at not overselling. You know, if somebody goes in with a budget in mind, because there's such variety now, it's quite easy to fit in a price category. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're lucky that you know there's a lot more coming on on stream, especially in Ireland. You know, yeah, we'll see a bit more of that. You know. And did you ever get the uh, the feedback that oh here's the Scotch man who's going to try and promote Scotch with us or anything like that? Do you ever get any of that negative feedback or negative reception? No, I, I'm pretty much a man of the whiskey world, and like all whiskeys, so I, I'm very much a whiskey for the moment. You know, yeah. and it's a lovely summer's day today. You know, um, and this is pro- probably. We're into the territory of green spot Chateau Montalina. Yeah. I always think that's a summer whiskey. I think it's almost like it's, you know, it's Prosecco for, for the hardcore whiskey drinker, you know? Yeah. So I think it's got this lovely sort of citrusy freshness about it. And even the, the Chateau Leo Vobarton green spot, they're lovely fresh summery whiskies, you know? Yeah. I wouldn't be drinking a lag of Ulan today, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's a whiskey for an occasion and in different yeah. circumstances, of course. And, when when you started in Celtic whiskey, how long did you spend there? Because I was, I was there two years. I got itchy feet. Um, I loved every moment of there. And Ali was a fantastic employer, uh, and the, the team around were excellent. Um, but I got itchy feet, and I was looking to move back into hospitality, into the bar industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I did move on, and you know, and that was the, the plan. And we took on a pub myself and my business partners. Pretty much within a few months after me leaving Celtic, um, that plan was was on, on well underway. Then you know, is that something you always wanted to do? Is just have your own bar? I mean, w- once you decided I want to do hospitality, having your own bar was one of the things you wanted. Yeah, I think when you start moving through the levels of management and whatnot in hospitality, you start looking at what's what's above it. You know, yeah, what's, what's the next step? And um, I think. Celtic was great because I was able to take a step back and look at hospitality from a different perspective um, yeah. and, and different hours. Uh, one, one thing, that, actually, one thing I had trouble with in the first year at Celtic was, uh, was sleeping um, because I went from working, you know, the sort of night hours into day shift hours and, you know, yeah. working, working 10 to 6 and I still wasn't going to bed at 4 in the morning. Right, okay, yeah. I had a whole year of that. Uh, really, just really bad sleep. Because uh, it was, it was almost in, institutionalized on these hours, you know. Yeah, uh, that was the hardest thing for me. Um, but it, then, it, so I, I, when I took a step back and I looked, I said, "That I think I want to go back to that." And when the pub Morgan came up in Stony Bar, that was it. It was just perfect timing. A quick question in there from Connor. He says, "What would be your go-to Irish whiskey or or even Scotch? Or do you have a go-to?" Oh yeah, I have, I have a go-to Scotch. Everybody knows that. Most, if you know me, you know my go-to Scotch is Highland Park. Right. Yeah. In front of me, I'm even wearing a Highland Park T-shirt. Uh, 
Highland Park 12 year my go-to scotch. Um, from an Irish perspective, uh, I used to, probably about 10 years ago, about even up, up to about eight years ago, we used to drink a lot of red breast. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed red breast, but then it just got too expensive. Uh, I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. We went from like 40 quid a bottle to 60 quid a bottle, which is fine. Uh, yeah. it just it went to I did a lot of my whiskey drinking in pubs before yeah. the before the pandemic. It just went too expensive in pubs. Uh, you know, it went from like six fifty a shot, and it started hitting a tenner, and then it's probably more than that in some places. Uh, yeah. You know, and that that for me was a bit um, a bit disappointing. So, and and John's Lane is another cracking whiskey, but you know, if you're drinking at home, it's great. You know, John's Lane. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's a cracking whiskey. Both of those that you mentioned, uh, and Highland Park. Like I, I've had a few Highland Park, and I have to say, I think it's changed quite a lot over the last four or five years. It's not quite the same as it used to be. Uh, I would notice maybe a few differences, but I wouldn't say it's mega. Yeah, uh, I, I, not in a bad way, not necessarily in a bad way, but it's certainly. Um, I think it had more character. Oh, it had, it had more character back in the 90s. There's no doubt about that. Uh, dist yeah. dist distillation techniques have moved on. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've, we've got a lot more sort of uh, what's a more environmental friendly with our distillation and, you know, and not, you, you know, trying to be a bit more. And that whiskey is always going to change. If you start changing the procedure, how you make it, you're going to have, you're going to have differences. Yeah. Uh, that, that's we're going to see a lot more of that and lots of sort of going forward and lots of whiskey distillers, you know. Um, are you still interested in the technical side of manufacture of whiskey? Yeah, so I went back to uh, education, I think in 2011, I went on the, the general certificate in distillation, just to go yeah. back. To uh, I had ideas, uh, grand ideas of opening a distillery uh, back then in, in, a, in, the, in the shade of the pub, um, but it never happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I had done that, you know, and now I probably have to go back and do it again. It's been 10 years. So I'd done that back then. I actually went to Scotland to do it uh, on a, one of these weeks' residential courses. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I found it quite easy because it, uh, it was like riding a bike. All the chemist, chemist, chemistry terms are starting to come back to me quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably have to do it again to, yeah, if I was going to implement it into practice, you know. But, yeah. Uh, the point of me, yeah. Um, but I thought I, I would. I wouldn't probably go any higher than that. I know you can go on and do a diploma. I wouldn't even bother doing that unless I was actually going to go work yeah. in, in, in production. You know? Is that something that you would consider moving into the production side or you prefer the hospitality side still? I prefer the hospitality side. Production, I, I love it and I do it and, and it's great. Uh, I've no, I, I don't have 20 million to open a distillery, so that sort of knocks that on the head. Yeah. Um, but you, you never say never. I think. For me, from from a whiskey side, if you're independent, bought one would be a, a nice place to go. Yeah, um, I've already done. We've already done a little bit of that. In fact, the Highland Park that I showed you is an L Mulligan release. Um, so never yeah. seen it. That's all. You never know what the future holds. Yeah. So I mean, you you, you opened your your bar in a pretty successful bar, uh, and if you don't mind me saying, I mean, it is now a very up and coming area. At the time when you set it up, it probably wasn't. As trendy as it is now, no. I'm trying to be polite. I remember we moved in. I think it was on a on a Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, we were just tidying up, repainting, and decorating, and doing all that sort of thing, and getting ready for opening. And at the time, there's a pub across the road. It has the same name now, but it was completely different. So then, it's called the Belfry. It was completely different back then. And uh, two people came out the the Belfry across the road. One of them got stabbed by the other. <laughs> That was on the Saturday night in the area, and we we're like, "Yeah, uh, we made the right move here. Uh, yeah. We persevered with it. You know, we we put our stamp on what we want to do. Uh, in fact, before we opened, I think the landlord was wanting to turf us out as well because uh, he got wind that we weren't going to sell Guinness. So, <laughs> so, so that was yeah. it. Like, what 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 is what is going on here? You know, uh, my pub with no Guinness. What's going on? You know." But uh, did it have a? Did that bar have a good range of whiskey before you took it over? No, I had a good range of stolen TDs. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't. No, it wasn't that bar. We it didn't have any craft beer. It was your run mill stuff. So it had a basic kitchen. It was a soup and sampling job. So Shawnee came in and sort of 
overhauled the kitchen and completely done that. Colin overdone the, over over seen the beers and whatnot. And I uh, I, I put uh, built some new shelving in the bar, made it look yeah. like it fitted in the current bar, the old bar. Um, put um, put some whiskies there and built a whiskey collection there as well. Yeah, I mean the restaurant stands on its on its own. It was a fully fledged restaurant. The quality is fantastic. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever gone in and uh, well, you're doing Sunday brunches as well at, at one point and yeah, stuff so like that. No, I think we're a bit different at the moment. It's a bit, it's a slightly limited more menu. We're open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sundays at the moment. Thursday, Friday yeah. night, all day Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Uh, there's not much business around sort of Tuesday, Wednesday, whatnot at the moment, but there's a space there to be used. Hopefully we get inside it's a space to start doing all, uh, you know, in person whiskey tasting. So I think yeah. we can get that. There's Liam saying the price of red breast. You didn't say if that's the cast strength or not, so maybe that's a different. I would pay nine. I pay. I pay nine pound in the bottom of the car to listen to Paul as well. Uh, yeah, I probably, I probably ordered a double. You know. Yeah, I mean, do you miss Scotland? Do you go back? I go back for whiskey. I don't. My mother's passed away now, so uh, I, I go back and see the father now and again. We have an on-off relationship. It's blah blah blah. I, I was always a lot more stronger alongside my mother. Yeah, that way. Um, she passed away a few years ago. I have uh, two brothers and a sister in Dundee as well. Um, I keep in touch with, but we were. I was always the black sheep. I was the one that fled. You know, I went away as I said. Yeah. I love to go back to Scotland, and uh, you know, I don't go and see the family as often as I should do. The majority of times I'm in Scotland, I'm in a whiskey distillery. Well, yeah. you're in Isle a lot of the time. I, I notice. Yeah, I, I love I love visiting. I love visiting distilleries. Uh, I, I think. Uh, any any distillery built pre two thousand and ten, I've visited them all in Scotland. So basically, any of the new ones since two thousand and ten, I actually haven't visited them yet. But every other one, I've I've ticked the box many years ago, and some some into double digit visits. Right. I think, okay. I think I've visited off in Caution and Glasgow about sixteen times at this stage, and um, because it's quite near the airport, it's a stop off from Glasgow on your way somewhere. Why not? Let's go and off and Caution, Caution, get a few drams inside us. You know. Um, Have you been to that? Uh... Have you been to that new Glasgow distillery, the Glasgow City distillery? No, no. So I haven't. Yeah. All the, any new distillery in the last ten years, I'll have to yeah. drop the list and start visiting. Yeah. Them, you know, but I think that the experience of visiting a whiskey distillery, okay. Once you've seen a pot still, you've seen a pot still, and once you've seen a mash tun and the grist and the happy cows and all that stuff, blah 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 blah. But it's what you get at the end of it. It's that mm -hmm. experience that whiskey with the people who are around it making it. You know, you know it's, it's it's just phenomenal and, and what's 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 happening what's new what, what's happening in the still is the technology or a lot of the time you get a, a warehouse testing which just can't be you know there's nothing better than drinking a whiskey in a whiskey warehouse you know straight out of a cask yeah I mean, how do you compare the visitor experience of uh, scotland and, and that of visiting a distillery here they're very similar um you know i think that they're very they're very good like you know there's was, I think there was a great thing doing the rounds on Twitter there of a Scottish comedian last week about uh, yeah. a, bad, a bad Scottish uh, uh, tour guide. Um, yeah, there, there, you know, one in a million they are. You know, the most of them I've, I've come across have been really accommodating. It's the same in Ireland. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's a similar experience, I think. It wasn't until recently because a lot of the time the visitor experience in Ireland, you're not actually visiting a distillery, you're visiting a brand's home. Yeah. Um, but now, the, 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 you know, Bushnells has a really good, interesting tour. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Teelan has a very good, interesting tour. Don't get me wrong, Jameson and Middleton are excellent, you know, uh, yeah. tour centres to go and see and see what's going on there is great. Um, but, uh, you know, and I'm sure there's others I've, I've mentioned. You know, I was up in County Down a couple of weeks ago on the bank holiday and I went to Raidmond, Cologne and Eklundville. I heard about that trip, yeah. That was a bit that wasn't a touristy tour. That was like, you know, that was, uh, you know, educational visit, shall we say. Yes. Yeah. So I heard. <laughs> so I, I, I think there's some people still feeling the effects of that one, but enough said about that. But, uh, you know. Uh, okay. So look, you, you said El Mulligan's and, and then you decided to go into the retail trade. I mean, yeah. what possessed you? Madness. Um, no, um, so what happened is we built up a lot of people and, and, and customers in the pub 
and we're doing whiskey recommendations. And this is not just in Dublin or Ireland. This is across the world. We were saying yeah. by email, and they were like, you know, there'll be whiskies that are only available in Ireland, and people want it in, in America. And I'm like, well, there's a market there for us to do that and get it out there. So we started an online shop at the time. It's a very basic name. I think they called it irishwhiskeyshop.ie at the time. And we sort of specialised in different whiskies that you couldn't, weren't always available in these markets at the time, you know, limited edition stuff and whatnot. Um, and, you know, old Middletons and some of this, you know, some of the more collectible stuff and sort of bringing the seller and buyer together via this website. But sort of starting there, and that done really well. And we, then we went into into retail. In fact, the unit we, we, the, the shop was in, was my business partner, Colin, actually went, he wanted to turn it into a small restaurant, uh, a small Italian restaurant, and the, the center was having none of it. He said, there's enough bloody restaurants around here, which was absolutely true. Um, yeah. So he says, what about a whiskey shop? And I thought we were a little bit early for what we were doing, but, you know, we, we, we rolled it, and we, I think we, we put together a fantastic shop, in fairness, and I think it's the most, mm-hmm. beautiful, most beautiful retails, retail uh, what's in Dublin. Um, unfortunately, I... Uh, we found back the case we've, we've had to because we, we had a big heavy reliance on tourism. We built that network up. Uh, yes. And we don't have that. And so we can open and pay rent and or pour money down the drain, you know. Um, so. And I'm sure rent there was uh, was not cheap. It's, 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 Dublin, it's behind Brown Thomas. That's all you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but I mean, it, it certainly was a fantastic store. And. You know, even in terms of the layout and the presentation, but you did a few things that were very innovative. I thought at the time, uh, one of them being the the hip flask scheme that you had. Yeah, and that came from sort of the, the, the thing like you know, there's so many whiskies that are coming out in the market in the last few years. It's hard to keep up with. Yeah, uh, hard for consumers to keep up with, and uh, you know. So again, if you're coming to spending like 80 to 100 euro on a bottle of whiskey, um, yeah. it can be a little bit, you know, so if you can get like a 150 mil on a hip flask, which is just shy of a quarter of a bottle, and you pay uh, maybe the quarter of the price, plus a little bit on top for like, say, corkage, yeah, buy that without having to commit to the full price. So that was the whole idea around that. Uh, and that, that went, that was great. That was absolutely brilliant. And it, it brought a lot of consumers to us. Um, yeah. And it, you know, it was it was copied very well with other by other 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 stores. Fair play to them. Um, so, unfortunately, something like that is a bit. We were it's a very difficult thing to do now because <laughs> would, you, would you believe it? Pretty much any of the bottles we had on the hip fast service, everybody knows them. Yeah, everybody yeah. So, bottles, everyone sniffed them. Yeah, know? yeah. Well, that was the thing. I mean, you go and sniff them and decide what you want to put in your. Yeah. yeah, hip flask, and it was good value, and it was a good scheme. So it's a bit harder to do now. So I, we do plan to start, keep the hip flask thing going in in the pub at some stage in some way. And um, we have been selling fifties and hundred mil sort of measures online, and um, yeah. keep it going. But there's nothing like that experience on your hip flask, a little glass bottle. No, great, you know? oh yeah, um, that was crazy. It was certainly one of the things. But I mean, you did a lot of stuff there. I mean, you had a. Obviously, you had a whole range of spirits as well. Uh, you had a, the engraving room, I think, was one of the first as well. Was well, And then what was it you were doing? Um, bouquets of whiskey, essentially, you know, coming up to Christmas where you would have a, a hamper. Yeah, so we're just matching different bits and pieces and bringing chocolates and whatnot, and different, you know, ma- ma- making things, so make, making a gift for people. Yeah. You know, it's a ready-made gift, you know, and just yeah, whiskey hampers are they're really popular. You, you, you can sell them to the thousands of them in December. Um, yeah, just pairing things up, with nice gifts within 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 the set, you know. Uh, one of them you know, was a really nice coffee fil- coffee filter, some three fe coffee, you know, all the ingredients to make yourself a really good Irish coffee. Yeah, uh, you know, without you know, don't need to be using the Nescafe here, you know. Or, the yeah. Thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, do you miss the shop at all, or are you glad that's sort of behind you? The pressure of having to keep a retail store open when there's nobody around. It's a bit of both, obviously. It's a beautiful. It was a beautiful place, and it was, it was great years there. And the staff are amazing, uh, and the staff were actually f- fantastic. It, you're, I was very lucky with them. You know, there wasn't there wasn't like uh, no shows and and sicknesses all the time. They weren't that type of staff. They're actually excellent. 
Um, yeah. Except the one that's listening in tonight, because I know there's one of them on the chat there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's hiding. <laughs> or he or she, but I'll say no. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So well, I mean, I used to love going in there just for a chat. Yeah, the problem was I was a terrible people. spender, but it was uh, too many people came in for a chat. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I spent a few, I dropped a few a few punt in there, but not much. But yeah, but no, no, it was good fun. I mean, it's a bit easier now to manage. You know, have it online, and you know, you can you know things like that. It's easier to do. I can work from home. You know, work you can desktop, keep our virtual tastings going. So we're still very active. We're still going we just don't have the burden of a retail shop because i think retail is going to be difficult for the next couple of years then no matter what industry you're in you know it's got, you know when did you start noticing this uh resurgence and this kind of hive of activity around irish whiskey when do you think the whole thing started lifting and uh, what caused it jesus i, I think when I, when I was in when i was in celtic whiskey shop about 2008 I used to go out on the road to sell whiskey to bars and restaurants and none of them wanted any of it, you know, knocking on doors and getting nowhere. And then I remember someone come in and they're looking at all the different brands on the shelf and um, then they started talking and, and, and I knew who they were. And we got talking really well and we just had this mad conversation about whiskey. And he says, feck it, I'm going to open a distillery. I went, oh, yeah, good luck to you. And he did. He went and opened the Dingle distillery. It was all over Hughes. All right, yeah. And I think that was back in 2008. He had loads of plans and loads of ideas, and he went through the motions of doing that. And I loads of great chats with Oliver, and I thought he was mad to go and open the distillery. But he really sort of set the benchmark for getting it started again. I know yeah. the guys down in Pierce Lines were doing it as well um, at the time, and the guys at West Cork, but they were quite quiet. Um, Oliver was very sort of lucky because he had a pub chain as well, so he could. He could start producing gin and vodka and supply himself. Yeah. And so he was able to get things moving. Um, so th things like that. So I remember him, and I think he was sort of like sort of benchmark for getting things moving. And then, but when he pre sold so many founders' casks, I thought, crikey, he's onto something here. Yeah. Yeah. And he done really well that. And you no, know, um, I think that, that, you know, what are they now? What are we, 2021? So what are they, eight, nine years old? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I still think I think it's going to be one of them spirits that's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's it's really good at the moment, but you know that that stuff can be exceptional in five or six years' time. You know, but it's worth waiting. I think it's going to be worth waiting for sort of type of whiskey. Yeah, I mean the big plans down there, obviously, were you know they've been new distiller and they've uh, plans to expand. From what I can see, great stuff. You know, that's brilliant to hear. Yeah. So I mean. When did the involvement, or when did you start looking at uh, setting up a society? So you, you're one of the founders, or if not the founder of the Irish Whiskey Society. How did yeah. that come about? So technically, I am the founder of the Irish Whiskey Society. Um, I'll explain that later on as we come into this. So back in 2007, 2008, when I was working for Celtic, um, they would have sort of ad hoc whiskey tastings based on the brands they imported. Mm -hmm. so for, at the time, Celtic had a, a relationship with who it would have been. It would have been Morris and Bowmore at the time. And Morris and Bowmore owned Bowmore Distillery in Auchentoshan and yeah. Glengarry, Glengarry up in the Highlands, just uh, east of Speyside there. So they had them three distilleries in their portfolio. Uh, so Glengarry was a, was a dead duck over here because nobody could pronounce it. Um, so there's just no point having it on, you have it on the shelf, but Auchin Caution, you could just get away with it. And because it's triple distilled, it yeah, had a difference there. And then Bowmore with that smoky peatiness. So we used to do Bowmore events. Um, and that was that was the sort of the way it started. And they were very much like in Celtic, they wanted to focus on the brands they were importing. It's a yeah. great thing to do. So I thought that there's, there's a potential for more sort of events. And there's lots of people out there who want to attend these events, you know. So it, it was sort of one of these ways that I wanted to meet up with like-minded people to drink whiskey and enjoy it and have fun yeah. and have that conversation. It doesn't always have to be in a pub, you know. And I was looking at it that way. And so I made some flyers up and I just started handing them out to people. And then um, we done, I think someone set up like 
a forum, an online forum at the time where people can jump in and then yeah. we all, we all, so that was probably pre Facebook days. Yeah, so that yeah, it was November, December two thousand and eight. We started putting all that in. And then so we got Christmas out of the way and we just had a bit of a run at it in January and we got everybody together. I think it was the 29th of January 2009. Uh, it was a Thursday night and there was, I think there was 30 people in the room. We met upstairs in Bowes. Yeah. And if anyone doesn't know what upstairs in Bowes is, it's no longer there now. It's actually a part of the hostel above it. But that used to be an upstairs like function room bar. So we met in there, uh, yeah, 2000, January 2009. And I think everybody who was there on the night became a founding member. Um, yeah. I was the one that sort of got them all together, got it off the ground, got going. And then a couple of weeks later, a committee was formed that we, I think we went to, it used to be a restaurant called Pizza Stop at the back of the Westbury there. Um, oh, yeah. I think it's knocked down now. We all went out there, had pizza. I used to be sheets to the wind. I went out drinking pints in the afternoon. It was my day off. And turned up to this sort of the inaugural committee meeting. Um, so I was I was made the the, the outgoing president because uh, I didn't want to be on the committee really. So I was like the ex officio or whatever it's called, the outgoing president sort of person, and a, a committee was set up, and that was just the committee was needed to to organise things. And and then I think we met in Bowes a couple more times, done a couple more tastings. <laughs> I went in one Tuesday night to Bowes just to make sure the room was all ready for us. Yeah. Um, no, sorry, I went on the Monday. And the bartender, Jim, says, Nick, I've still got you in the book on, uh, for Thursday night upstairs. Is that okay for the whiskey club? He says, yep, yeah, no problem. That's and We'll be here, Jim. Excellent. He goes, I'll see you on Thursday, Nick. I'm working myself that night. <laughs> so I went in on the Wednesday, and Jim was working on the Wednesday as well. And um, I had, had a beer. <laughs> so at the time, you used to go upstairs and Bose was at the back beside the, the – it was the door to the toilet. It's now where the cigarette machine is. I went up and I went into the bathroom and I came out of the bathroom and I went, something's not right here. And I was like, what's going on here? I can't, I couldn't picture it. He'd walked off the stairway and built a wall. So I came back down, I came back down to Jim and I said, Jim, what's going on here? He says, what do you mean? He says, how did you get upstairs now? There's a wall there where the staircase is. He went, and he'd been there for four hours that day already. And he didn't oh, he said, notice. <laughs> Builders were in. Builders and built a wall. And he's like, oh, so it was hastily changed at the last minute. And I think we moved to Brooks Hotel because I had formed there. I knew people there and I knew there was a function room down below. Yeah. Uh, and so we moved there and we were there for a little bit as well. Uh, as I started to start there, it was working tastings there for a few years. And, but that was it. The idea was just to get people in a room drinking whiskey and having fun. Yeah. You know? that, that I think it. people forget how important, you know, those early meetings even meetings in the Celtic whiskey shop and then joining the society. I mean, there were a core five or six people, I guess, who were involved at the time. And uh, then it really kind of took off, I guess, in the last, what, what is it, 250, 300 members now? I think it's at 400 now, yeah. Is it? Wow. Yeah. I'm still on the committee there. I'm actually in more, more of a role in the committee these days. Yeah, I noticed that you're involved in the cast selection and events kind of side of it as well. Yeah, yeah, I do, I do, I do my, my part. Um, but yeah, it's, it's at the stage because people have to remember it's a voluntary organisation. Nobody's paid to do the work. So, you know, it's all right me sending out tasting packs every week. Um, you're paying me to do that. You're paying for the set and whatnot. And yeah. I'm making a little bit of profit on it, let's be honest. But the society, you know, okay, they're making a little bit of profit on it and goes to purchase the casks. But nobody's getting paid to put these bottles together. But, yeah. You know, uh, they have one the fancy bottle and cappers as well. Um, but they're all doing it out of the goodness of their heart, you know. Yeah. And, and we send a lot of packs out, you know. Yeah. Well, well, it's a hugely successful society, and uh, I think Brian Green's really given it an extra jolt of life there in the last year and a bit, even though it's been a yeah. difficult time. Without a doubt, I think every president and everybody who's, who's been involved in society has been excellent. But for yeah. me, Brian, Brian, I've always said, I've, I've made no secret of this. Brian, for me, has been the standout uh, president yeah. of the whiskey site. He's really driven things on. He's streamlined things. Decision making's a lot quicker. We can move on things and act on things. So, uh, you know, we don't, nothing, uh, you know, you can do things a lot quicker now via email and just let's get things over the line. We don't have to yeah. drag our heels all the time for things. So we can move on things. And, you know, we're 
lots of exciting plans. You know, you mentioned the cast committee, and the cast committee go out and find different casks of whiskey from different whiskey distilleries to put in the archive and set down so that we can bought them in years to come. So, yeah, I know there's a lot of casks there on the go. What is it you're looking for? Or is there something that you're looking for when you're actually making a cast selection? Uh, so we have, we have Finon and Connor on there. And so Finon's very much looking for different mash bills. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just looking for quality. I'm looking, yeah. I want to see, I want, if there's real good new make there and there's really good wooden casks, really good casks, you're going to have a good, you're going to, you're going to get a good whiskey at the end of it. Um, yeah. so, you know, that, that's why we were up in, in County down there visiting three distilleries to go, you know, to go around and see what we can put it way down for the society. Yeah. Um, so that, that's been, for me, that's been, you know, that's been really good and looking, you know, but yeah, Fennel's very much in the, the mash bill, uh, different mash bills and that's excellent because you want something different. It's, there's a lot out there that can be done. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I want to see some peated malt, double the still, triple the still, and, and grain, and have some other stuff that's there just so you have it there. And, and then, you know, look at different maturation. We've, you know, we've a cask in Dingle that's moved, it, it, was, it was recasked into um, a first, uh, no, sorry, a, a, a virgin bur bur American oak barrel, and mm -hmm. it hadn't had a stunning impact on it for a little while. So we've taken okay. out on. And recast again so things like that just playing around the whiskey so we can create a really good final product um, i mean you must you yourself as the l mulligan shop and as the l mulligan bar had your own uh, casks as well before it was trendy to do so i guess um you must have been one of the first to have your own casks what were yeah. the ones you were what were the ones that you chose so we've had, we've actually had three. We could have had a lot more, but we've actually rejected so many. Um, yeah. Our first one was a nine-year-old single malt from Cooley. Uh, uh, John Cashman helped us put get that out over the on, over the line, and uh, we got it just before uh, it was sold to Beam Santori. Uh, yeah. It was like you need to get this over the line, and do the deal. So all that was rushed. So we actually bottled it without a label. Yeah. And then, we moved it to a bonded warehouse uh, with someone, and then there was problems uh, regarding that because we moved that label. And so this turned into something that should have taken a couple of weeks, took about three years. So it's already yeah. bought. It was bought before anyone else had done it. Uh, and then in the meantime, as we messed around with the label and all the customs and excise and what was going on there because the way it was moved, um, it didn't get released till some other people sold the others released their whiskies, but we brought it out. We put the label and we got it out, and that was really good. It was a, it was a simple nine year old coolie malt, forty yeah. percent ABV, but it was just really nice. I think it's a nine year old unpeated coolie malt. It's called Turconnell, and it was it was lovely, fresh, and citrusy. It was a beautiful whiskey, you know. Uh, I really I really enjoyed that. And then on the back of that, I went to Irish Distillers, and um, was looking for uh, you know a single cask from them. Yeah. Uh, and from the bar side of things again like retailers were doing it you know Celtic had a good few single cast Middletons from them uh, and it's, there was talks about doing that and, and um, anyway they, they, they decided to do a trial run with another bar at the time uh, mm -hmm. probably because they sold billions and billions of bottles of Jameson uh, we didn't and then they came back to us and we, we went we selected a power single cask we done a 15 year old powers um, we wanted to do it at cash strength at the time, didn't went down to 46. Um, that was an absolute stunner. Um, yeah, there was something different about that one compared to a lot of the other Powers yeah. single cast. So uh, powers, powers in general is second full bourbon. Mm -hmm. uh, this one was a first full bourbon. It was essentially a Middleton. Uh, so it should have been in a Middleton branded bottle, but it was. we got a, a selection of samples from them. Uh, we went through them. This was the standout one with us. And Jared Garwin come up and, you know, he was like, yeah, that's, that's, and as he said, I sort of knew they were going to pick that, you know? Yeah. Because it was amazing. And we had options to bottle more powers, but we, we said we could only bottle another cask of powers if it was better than the one we'd already done. Yeah. And we couldn't find that. So we never done another powers. Yeah. Uh, we could have done a red breast and we had lots of different red breasts um, but for me, I was like, Redbreast isn't really a single cast because 
it's all sherry component. You know, sherry's only a component of red breast. It's not the be all and end all. So it's very hard. Like a sherry, a single red breast single cask is not quite red breast really. You know, it's a component. They're all good. But, um, and then, well, the price of them is just ridiculous as well. So I put out, out, out with the budget, and we didn't we didn't think people would spend three four hundred quid on a bottle of red breast. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. How t- how times have changed. You know. yeah. But um, what was the other one you did? Was it was a uh, scotch you did? Yeah, so I have that in, I have that in front of me. Poured that. Uh, so we've done a Highland Park uh, single single one uh, cast strength again. Yeah. Uh, El Mulligan on the label. So my camera's acting up there. Uh, that's a twelve year old Highland Park, uh, all first fill European oak. Uh, it's all sherry. Um, lovely colour on it. You can see there. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that came about with. Um, there's a company called CC Hellenic, which is Coca-Cola. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they started taking on distribution for the Edgerton Group. So they were taking on McAllen, Highland Park, and Glen Rothes. Yeah. And so they came to talk to me about stocking them. And for two hours, I bent the ear off your man about uh, Highland Park. Uh, and he came back and says, look, there's... If I give you exclusivity on the Highland Parks and you go and sell them and do all you, what you want to them and you can sort of be the, the wholesale of the Highland Park, you'd be doing me a great favour and I know you love it. And I know, oh, yeah. so he says, what's in it for me? He says, I'll get you a single cask of Highland Park. <laughs> Happy <laughs> days. Where yeah. do I sign? Where do I sign? So we went through, the, went through the motions of that, samples and whatnot, and it got forgotten about, to be honest with you. And then I got a phone call last May, June, just after everyone had gone back to work a little bit after furlough. Yeah. Uh, he says, Mick, I've got your, uh, I've got 320 bottles of El Mulligan Highland Park in my warehouse. What do you want me to do with it? So, so I went, ah, I know what we're going to do. He says, we do all these virtual tastings. I says, I'm going to do this big mad one. And I'm going to I'm going to do a whiskey festival on a Saturday afternoon. I'm going to call it Distilled. And I'm going to send out everybody a sample of this whiskey and that's going to be the launch of, of that. I'm going to launch it at my own sort of mini whiskey festival on the Saturday afternoon. And uh, that was it. So we got it out. And, yeah, we had, a, we had a, several hundred people attended that on the online virtual whiskey festival. It was a great day. Is that sold out now, that single, that hard and back? No. So people think it is. Um, it goes on sale and off sale quite a bit because it takes a little bit of time to get it out of the warehouse. Yeah. Uh, because it, it gets delivered to me at home. Um, and then, so I end up drinking half of it. Well, there's Mick McGuire there is uh, asking about the, another festival, and uh, he's obviously a fan of that single cask. I definitely want to do another festival, yeah. Um, picking the time. Last year, we done it in July because there was nothing else to do. Um, <laughs> I'd rather get it towards the end of the, the, end of the year. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I wouldn't like to conflict with anybody else. Uh, last year, we... we we accidentally, con- we didn't quite conflict. We conflicted with Belfast Whiskey Week. To, mm-hmm. to be honest, I actually didn't know that was going on. And that was that. And once you set your date and sold tickets, you sort of, you, you can't move. You have to do it. Yeah. So we barely, it wasn't quite a, it wasn't quite a conflict. In fact, our festival was this Saturday week, you know, so exactly a year ago. And Belfast Whiskey Week started a week later. It yeah. wasn't quite a conflict, but, you know, so you don't, you're trying to find a space. So I think they're good friends at Celtic have got something going on, doing a bit of virtual there. Whiskey Live's happening. And then you've got the Whiskey Show in London, and they've got a bit of a virtual thing going on there as well. So if, if there's space for us to do something, we'll definitely do something. Yeah. Um, as, for a, as, as for another single cask at uh, Highland Park, um, that's going to be a difficult one, Mick, because, as I mentioned, with the powers, the powers are so good, we couldn't find another one better than that, so we didn't do it, bottle it. I think I can have the same problem with this, because this is an absolute stunner. As you've said yourself, and you know, sixty-three point seven percent, or it, it drinks like forty percent. It's, it's so easy. What's the drink. finish on it? Is it all? It's all. It's, it's full, fully matured for twelve years in European cherry oak. So it's oh, fully um, okay. It's got a little bit of smokiness to it, a little bit of peat to it because it's not been diluted down to the forty percent. You know, but it's anyone that's had. It, I, I don't. I've never had anyone say a bad word about it. Uh, probably yeah. too to because you know <laughs> they, they, they know um, how much I like the stuff. But uh, I'd love to do another Highland Park single cast if we can get one. Um, yeah. And I'd love to do another festival. The sort of thing I'm sort of focusing on going forward for next year, Mick, is probably I've had a lot of people asking me to do this. Is uh, some whiskey tours of Scotland. So 
I really want to do a whiskey tour of Isla and a whiskey tour of Speyside sometime next year. So that's really something that I want to really go for because yeah. I love doing these things and bringing friends and doing that and just having a great time, you know. We have last week's guest, Chris, uh, mentioning that in-person tasting is the way to go. Uh, let's hope so. But I mean, I think there's going to be, it will be kind of a hybrid model for a while anyway. But what do you make of the current state then of Irish whiskey? And, you know, you, you mentioned that you, you saw the offsprings of it, offshoots of it happening with the Dingle Distillery and Oliver Hughes setting up that. Uh, did you foresee that it would actually accelerate to the level it, it did? Did you, or and do you think it's just reached um, frantic levels now? I, I, I definitely knew that it was going to get to the level it, it, it's gone to because I seen it with the craft beer boom. You know, you went from having four or five breweries to having 50. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I knew whiskey was going to go that way. That's what happens in this country. We seem to all join the bubble with all the boom, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, two years ago there was one Irish whiskey auction. Now there's three, you know. So people people like to join, jump, the, jump on the bandwagon. I don't mean that in a bad way. People do yeah. like to involved in it and it, it's it's great so we're seeing a lot you know a lot of new new players in the market a lot of good people uh you know some really good stuff going up and uh, everyone knows i'm a fan of tipperary what they're doing down there and um, they've got a really good distiller to start with them and uh, they've experienced stuart nickerson for over 40 50 years in the industry yeah That's amazing and then i think i've, I've had I've been fortunate enough to chase a lot of liquid a lot of liquid a lot of whiskey at a great northern distillery yeah and, that stuff's phenomenal for such a young whiskey, you know. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, a lot of people come on board and do stuff. And I think, you know, is it sustainable? Of, do you think, Michael? If they're willing to you know, bide their time a little bit, and you know, if you start releasing whiskey at three year old, four year old, and it's not the greatest, then no, it's not sustainable because Emperor's New Clothes and all that, people will soon see through that. You yeah. know, um, we've got to, we've got to, we've just got to wait. You know, we've got to hold on. Whiskey takes time. You know, let it mature for a little bit. You know, get some really good flavours in there, and away we go. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's always going to be that sort of first release from a distillery when it's three or four year old. That's expected. Um, you know, a bit. So, is it sustainable? Yeah, the the biggest the market leader, Jameson, I think, is only in twenty two states of America. Yeah, if I'm right in saying there's fifty states in America. I don't know how many. The last there. I checked, yeah. Uh, we haven't. We haven't. Nobody's gone to China yet. China's no. starting to happen. I mean, I can see a lot of independent bottlers and a lot of uh, new distilleries. That's their playground, if you like. Someone asked me uh, a wine, a person in Spain who was shipping to China, Spain, Spanish whiskey into China, asked us a few year, a year ago if we can get them three hundred fifty thousand bottles of four or five year old whiskey, and they needed it next week, and they wanted to take it into one province in China, and they need that order every quarter. <laughs> yeah look i've heard i've heard uh yeah some crazy numbers like but i i know there's a significant amount of uh, containers going over weekly you know weekly so i it probably i'd say it will be one of the next big markets russia is certainly becoming big yeah. france is becoming bigger australia i think as well but in, in terms of how irish whiskey sits on the world stage where do you place it in terms of one competitiveness and secondly in quality? Uh, Probably the other way around would make more sense. Uh, well, see, I'm not biased saying Scotch whiskey is excellent, and you know, but Scotch whiskey had the market and has been the market leader for years. You know, uh, you know, what, if you look at a lot of stats, a lot of people tell you Indian whiskey is quite high, but forget about that market of India because a lot of it's sold in their own market. You know, there's yeah. some Indian whiskies, you know, like Paul John and whatnot. They're stunning whiskies. But forget that. If you look at the real whiskey market, um, you know, Scots is the market leader. You know, Japanese done really well, but they ran out. And then, in fact, most of, the, most of what was in the Japanese bottles was probably Scotch anyway. Yes. Uh, um, you know, and then bourbon's always been strong. American whiskey, there's a lot, you know, a lot of craft distilling over there as well that's, that's booming, but we don't see as much of, you know. Um, mm. so that, that's going really well but there's, there's a definitely a place for Irish whiskey there because it doesn't matter where you go in the world you always find someone who's got Irish heritage you know? yeah someone uh, so there's, there's there's that people buy into it that way so 
Pricing is a little bit, pretty, a little bit steep, to be perfectly honest with you. I do yeah. think Irish whiskey is quite a little bit steep. Uh, I'm fed up hearing all these stories and, you know, try, and I, I do it myself sometimes to defend them, you know, tax and duty. Uh, that's, that's a little tripe, you know. Uh, yeah. Tax and duties are higher in this country, but they don't make the whiskey 20, 30, 40 quid more a bottle. You know, there's that, okay, there's moving things around and shipping does. I get, I get why whiskey's going to be a little bit higher, but. I mean, the, the, there is a, a fixed base cost that is just higher in Ireland, and that's it. Like, yeah, you know, the, yeah. the cost of doing business in Ireland is not cheap. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, there's no doubt about that part. So that, 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 that could be a little bit difficult, you know. Um, the price, the price might be a slight barrier to entry. Uh, yeah. You can't call it, every, not everything can be premium, you know. Not everything can be yeah. super premium, you know. I always say that like, the whiskey drinkers are, are on a pyramid. <clears throat> Most of us are at the bottom of the pyramid, pyramid. And as the pyramid comes up to the top, there's like one or two people there with the millions, you know. All, most of us are down at the bottom. We feed from the bottom. We drink the, the least expensive whiskies, you know. Do people drink from the bottom up? Uh, so do they start at the lower end and start moving their way up, or or do they just kind of stay at one level? Do you think? I think there's a bit of both. I always always say that in, in, in a bar setting, like you know, you should have the family of whiskey. So I mentioned Bowmer in Scotland there. So like the twelve year old, the fifteen, the eighteen, you should have them yeah. together. So. Red rest, 12, 15, 21, you know, together. Uh, and, and have a family. Like, I, you know, if you look at, I use this, an old story, probably not quite true, but it's like, an, I call it, a normal, call it a normal legend, shall we? You know, if you're a student in America, you know, and you're knocking back the Jameson picklebacks, that's what, you know, as a, yeah. as a, as a student, you know, as you get a more, dis when you get your degree and you get a job and you have more disposable income, you'll probably buy the Jameson 12 year old, you know, and you'll drink yeah. that. Uh, and when you've had children, you've sent them off pack into university, into college, you've got more disposable income, you'll probably drink James an 18 year old. You yeah. know, I hope use that analogy sort of thing. It's it's the same. It's why McDonald's do happy meals, because once they've got you, they've got you for life. You know, give, give the kid a happy meal, he'll be buying a Big Mac when he's 20. You know? Yeah, that's true. True. Well, you, that's, that's it. So, you know, you if build them into the market and into the drinking whiskey, you know, and you move through the family, Johnny Walker. You know, you go from you go from red to black to, to green to blue. You know. Yeah. What are the trends out there that uh, are exciting you the most in the Irish whiskey scene? Um, there's been a lot of different stuff. Um, some of the stuff I'm still not sure about. There's a lot of beer cast maturation. There uh, is. I like the stuff with uh, being done with stout. Um, I don't think, I've, and I've, I've said this many times, I don't think IPA works uh, with whiskey. Um, I've actually got a pale ale here the, that I'm drinking, or I had. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I, yeah. I, 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 I just haven't found one I like. Yeah. Um, and, that, and I've tried all of them and I don't like any of them. And I yeah. probably don't like any of them coming out. So I, I, I do like the stout ones. Uh, I found I found uh, the Cora. Yeah, I yeah, the seaweed. Still, yeah, I still haven't got my head around it. Um, I had it on a private event last week. Um, as a tasting, because I, want, I wanted to see people's feedback that people who I didn't know. So this is like yeah. a tasting, so I didn't know anybody, so I was able to get the feedback genuinely. Um, there's 15 on the call, 10 liked it. I'm sorry, five liked it, 10 didn't. As, yeah. we went, as we went through the discussion, two more liked it by the end. Uh, for me, I thought it had the worst nose I've ever tasted, sm smell in a whiskey. <laughs> But when I drank it, I was quite quite pleasantly surprised by it. Um, yeah, I still haven't got my head around it. There's a new one out, so I'd like to get. To get to yeah, the Wakama. We 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 had them on the show. We had Patrick on the show there a couple of weeks ago, and he launched the whiskey there. I have to say, I found it very interesting, uh, and I did prefer it on the taste than on the nose for sure. Yeah. It kind of really surprised me. Um, I like to see things, people trying things. You know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Move on to the next thing. Um, but you know, we don't have to reinvent the, reinvent the whiskey wheel. Whiskey works really well on bourbon casks. It works really well on fortified wine casks. Yeah. You, know, you get you give me a, a good um, good whiskey that's been mature for ten years in bourbon and finished in sherry for a year. I'll be a happy man. Yeah. You know, you know. What about this trend towards like uh, more single grains, more single casks? I suppose peated and all the rest. Um, single cask and cask strength, you know, I've, I've been a massive fan of that for the last 20 years and 
I've always been a member of the Scottish Malt Whiskey Society, and you know, I, there's probably uh, bottles on that shelf behind me there. It's all Scottish Malt Whiskey Society bottles. Uh, and I love that single cast cast strength. I do like that. Uh, we're going to see more grain on the market. It's, it's simply cheaper to buy. If, yes. you're an, if you're an independent bottle, it's cheaper to buy. Fact. That's that. So you're going to see a lot more of that on the market. Some of it's really good. The stuff coming from Great Northern's excellent, you know. Um, yeah. Prior to that, the stuff from Cooley was really good, provided it's matured in, 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 in fresh bourbon or uh, fresh ver fresh American oak or first fill bourbon. This stuff in third third fill is rubbish. Uh, yeah. I, I, it, it, there's nothing going, you know. So, uh, so if you're going to you may have to recast it into something else, do something like that and play around with it, so you get some nice grains. Um, yeah. You don't really have to reinvent the wheel, you know. Yeah. In terms of uh, what you're going to do, I mean, what are your immediate plans or where do you see yourself uh, in a few years' time? Strange one. I'm going, a bit, I'm going on a curveball. I'm going back to college this year, uh, but not, nothing to do with the drinks industry. Uh, I'm going to study organic farming. Very good. Uh, yeah. I, love, I love growing fruit and vegetables. And, um, I've been doing that. I have uh, about 500 square metres of an allotment in Clonsilla. So yeah. I grow lots of fruit and vegetables for the pub. Uh, we've been putting up, we started supplying there last weekend, bringing them down to the pub. So it was an ongoing thing with lots of different crops there. Yeah. And, uh, I love, um, I love, uh, I love fishing as well. So we've been doing a lot of fishing recently. In fact, I was out today on the bike for, down to Pool Bay. So I've been taking a, a backseat and looking at other things in life as well, because it was a, a rat race in whiskey for years, but, uh, Thanks, yeah. Yeah, definitely continue what we're doing our virtual tastings or in person. I'd, I'd like to do a bit more independent bottling, you know. Yeah, uh, I think we have a good, strong brand name. Uh, I'd like to think I'm good at selecting nice casks alongside my business partner, Sean Ian and Colin. Where we can select some really good casks, you know, where you yeah. don't buy for the sake of buying. You know? Well, your cask selection is much better than your football team selection. <laughs> Seen as uh, the great spell that Arsenal are going through at the moment, I, I mean, do you yeah. go to every? Do you go to every match? Um, if I was to put it in a context, see, Arsenal played fifty games a season. I'd probably do it 42, 43. Yeah, quite a large chunk, but that's I've changed it. That that it almost became a routine, you know. Yeah, it's just you're doing it, and you're doing it, and doing it. I don't, I don't think I'll be going back to that now. I'm, I'm getting too old for it anyway, you know. You'll go uh, a couple of times a year. I'm a bit more. I'm a bit more conscious with my air miles and traveling at the moment. You know, yeah. Uh, I like to think I do well with offsetting carbon footprint. Anyway, with growing lots of fruit and veg and things like that. And I, I see you on the bike. Yeah, I don't on drive. You know, yeah. uh, I have an electric bike and things like that. So I like to think, but the, yeah, there's a lot of air miles. You think if I want to go to Arsenal, match, you've got to fly there, and that's it. Yeah. Um, the only, time, the only time Arsenal played a competitive match in Ireland in the last 20 years was last year during the pandemic and there was no spectators allowed. <laughs> Sad's law, yeah. Sad's That's law. Cool. What All else? Right. I think I'll pick and choose what football matches I'll go to in the future. I won't be going every week. Uh, maybe every six or seven weeks, something like that. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you have a, a hobby that you do other than the, the fishing and the football then? Sorry, say that again, Sergio. Do you have a hobby that you you do outside of drinks and outside of fishing and food? Uh, nothing, nothing really. I I, I really like, like growing fruit and vegetables. Quite time consuming. Um, and doing I do that in my spare time, you know, and I love it. Um, you know, the produce goes to the pub, and I, I bring some home here. Uh, and fishing, I just love getting out there, and it's just quiet, you know. Fishing can be very frustrating, but uh, I, I love doing that. I, I love traveling and love the football and whatnot. Um, but, you know, I can't wait to get back. I love when I went to County Down there and done them three distilleries on the bank holiday. I, I just loved it, and I can't wait to get doing that again. Well, I know you're going up for uh, that tasting with Puna and O'Connor with the different mash bills this next week, actually, in a week's time. Yeah, so when the next that would be fantastic. Thing, so that's a nice research trip as well. You know, Liam's asking my Scottish team, uh, Dundee United. Uh, yeah. That's, mm. that's, that's, a, that's sitting on the fence there. <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously, the, the the business side of it, are you going to expand the business in any way? Are you looking to develop that uh, in terms of the in terms of the bar? 
I mean, what can you do, I guess, I suppose? With, the bar's, uh, what's... The bar's the bar. We, we had a second bar at one stage. We, we've tried a lot of different things in business, you know. Not everything works well, and, and you, find, you find different things. The bar's the bar, I, 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 and it's a beautiful, I think, we just... You know, get it back to its heyday pre-pandemic times would be it's the first challenge, you know. Yeah. And that's gonna take some time. And then we'll see, we'll go from there, you know. Um but yeah, definitely do something with whiskey. I'm you know really, really want to uh do something on the, the independent bottling line, you know, that's something. Yeah. Uh, do you see any any movement in any other spirits, you know? I mean, cognac and rum were always talked about being the next big thing. Do you you know, being in the bar side, being on the retail side, does that give you a, a unique perspective that maybe a lot of people don't have? Yeah, yeah. cognac died in the seventies. You know, um, con cognac's yeah, cognac's gone. Con I, I can never see cognac coming back. They can try all they want with that, but uh, cognac sales were never strong. In the twenty years that I've been in the industry, industry mm -hmm. you know, cognac was never never strong. Of course, it's pretty, it's pretty strong in uh, Asia and in the states, though. Yeah, yeah, as a luxury brand and whatnot. Yeah, but I think whiskey will all dominate that. Rum is all is like the always promises to deliver, and I've seen it so many times. It's, this is the next big thing, and it never happens. It gets to its level. Yeah, uh, I see a cracking bottle of rum behind me there, a nice twenty-one-year-old Appleton Estate, and it's just an, an amazing rum. Yeah, uh, I love rum, but I remember rum was going to get big in about oh seven or eight. They said it was coming big again. And then it became a race to the bottom. Who can make the cheapest mojito? Uh, <laughs> and that's what I think that really had a detrimental effect on it. Um, well, mojito is what drove it for a long time. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. One cocktail. And it's, you know, when you, when you tell people about that, people have this. We've also had a couple of bad products in rum. You know, them dark rums, that old sea dog. And all oh, that. yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just full of, I don't, I'd imagine there's some sort of colouring in there now. I mean, you'd actually tell people that dark rum is actually more golden and mahogany in colour, then it's not this sickly rubbish. Yeah. You know? um, so that, you know, rum, rum, rum will come back, but I don't know how strong it'll come back. Whiskey's, a, whiskey's just a juggernaut at the moment, isn't it? You know? Yeah. And you, you don't see the future of that changing anytime soon. Or, or, do you think we're just at the very start of the resurgence of Irish whiskey? Oh, yeah. No, we're only at the start because all these new distilleries haven't got any whiskey yet, you know. And we've got to wait a few years till it's matured long enough to, to call it, you know, to call it um, the whiskey. So that's yeah. that's interesting, you know. Yeah, so long way to go. I think another thing that rum, rum, and, rum and, you know, cognac have always struggled, you know, they, they can only really be, really be produced in these countries. It's very hard to make rum in Ireland, you know. We don't have a a massive growth of sugar cane and whatnot here and we're not growing grapes to make a brandy are we you know not yet oh well, a bit more global warming and we'll be all be you know sitting back in the balcony we're eating grapes however you, you can grow barley quite a lot of places and it's easy to move around yeah you know, um and it keeps well so you can grow you know you can make whiskey in pretty much any country really yeah um, what else are you looking forward to then any any particular brand that is really exciting you? What they're doing? Uh, Cologne. Yeah, uh, I, re I really like Cologne. Uh, what they've got, what they're going up there. It's very very small in fairness, so there's not much coming there. I'm really excited to see what uh, Redmond will bring out. I thought the new maker is just absolutely stunning. Uh, yes. If, if anyone gets a chance to try any of the Redmond estate new make, you're you're going to be blown away by it. It's just absolutely stunning, and I think what's going on there is excellent and. Yeah, you know, like I said, Tipperary, really interesting to see what's going on there. Blackwater, uh, yeah. we've already seen quite a bit out of uh, out of Waterford. In fact, you know, there's like three million releases from them now, isn't there? There's a lot of new releases, yeah. But I think they're coming out with their first, uh, not their first organic, their first biodynamic one soon. Right, and then so there's, there's lots going on, and I thought. I was I was on a testing with the the Aviators Whiskey Club a few weeks ago, and so who is it? Royal Oak under the the Buskers yeah. brand. Yeah, uh, yeah. I thought, I thought one of the whiskies were rubbish, but the others were excellent, and so uh, the pot still was quite nice. Something going on there. Yeah. Uh, still quite young. You know, give it a few more years, it's going to be excellent. So there's lots going on. There's, there's in fairness, it's, it's very hard to. Uh, I don't know why Stuart thinks Tipperary would be. I, I've mentioned we got that in. We got I, that in. 
Yeah. Of course. Uh, for advertising there. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> look, uh, I think uh, you've pivoted so well and you've adjusted so well in a really difficult time. Uh, I think, you know, I really hope you continue to do those tastings because literally there was, there was one every week. Yeah. Uh, well, and they were definitely something very different to the norm, which is what I enjoyed. We want, well, we, we were doing them in person every fortnight. And yeah. That was in 2019. So in 2019, as we wound them up, uh, in in November, in fact, the last one in 2019 was a Glen Farkless, and they came over and they brought like a five or five or six grand bottle of whiskey and cracked open for the night, oh. and we weren't even ex we weren't expecting that. They're like, there you go, I'm like thanks, and happy days. Uh, so after that, we started thinking about uh, planning what 2020 was going to look like in the, the world of sort of online uh, of, of in person tastings. And I thought, right, we'll kick off in February and we'll do them every week and we'll run it right through till November maybe taking a break in the summer, you know? Yeah. So we, that was our plan, was to run them every week just to see how we can get on doing it. And so that's why we done them every week last year, pretty much, except in the summer and it's a little quieter. Uh, we've done them every week virtually because we were planning to do it. You know, all we done, we moved from in person to online. You know, a lot of people, we, we were starting our, we started our virtual tasting at the end of March, you know, beginning yeah. of April. Uh, everybody else didn't really catch up until a little bit later uh, before they started getting on onto it, you know, uh, because they had no plan, you know, so we, we had a plan in place and it was just simple of moving it from a glass to a mini bottle and post, putting it in the post. So we were, it was easy enough to do for us that way. Yeah. Uh, so we'll continue to do that, you know, we'll plan ahead that way and we'll, you know, I think you know, the hybrid model is what I'm looking at at the moment for at least the next unless six to 12 months anyway you know hopefully yeah. yeah well listen thank you very much for taking the time to to join us uh, michael i mean i know i mean when when somebody talks about irish whiskey and the growth of irish whiskey your name is in there with it you've always been promoting the drinks industry and i suppose through the society and and through doing all these tastings you played a huge role in it I think uh, I've also grown with the, the whiskey industry as well because I've put an extra four inches on in the last 10 years, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, that'll be worked off on the bike, I'm sure. Although you went and got an electric bike, so that's cheating. Uh, yeah, dodgy knees. I did the operation last year, and I have to get another one on the other knee, so... Yeah, gone for well, hopefully, uh, yeah. hopefully you see the good side of that and be ready for when everything's open. Look, I, I just want to thank you again for, for joining and thank you for what you do for the industry. And I know, I know people hugely respect uh, what you've done and uh, you've always been useful for advice as well. I mean, I know we, I know we haven't always seen eye to eye and, and uh, I suppose publicly I may apologize in public for probably been a, having been a bit outspoken on, uh, uh, sure. On a number of occasions, but I think that's the you know, joy of the industry, you know. And you know, have you have we all agreed on everything that we that we bought him, you know? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, yeah. uh, I I put my hand up and say I, I was wrong, and I apologise. But uh, look, um, thank you very much, as I said, for, for coming on the show. I look forward to. I'm sure, we met up for a coffee there recently, and uh, I'm sure we'll we'll catch up again before Definitely. too long. So actually, we'll probably catch up at the Belfast. Uh, tasting of uh, the new make so yeah definitely um I'll, I'll, I'll be run i'll be the one running them up that night because it'll be like whoa, whoa I don't want it <laughs> yeah i know it's like a, like a holiday going up to belfast so <laughs> look thank you thank you all very much as i said uh, it's been a an honor to have you on michael and i always respect you. from a business and from a um you, you always give a very honest opinion of what you think of something and uh I don't always agree, but I mean, at least you, you're straight up and give the truth, what you believe to be the right answer. So thank you very much. It's not always the right answer. It's my opinion. And that's yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you're right. <laughs> Sometimes you're right. Look, thank you very much. And uh, sure, look, uh, that tasting that you mentioned in two weeks time about tasting the Radamon is what I was referring to earlier. So we have three new make samples that we're doing in conjunction with Belfast Whiskey Week and with Radaman uh, Estates, and we're really looking forward to sharing those. So we'll release detail, and we have a limited number of those to send out, and then there are some packs that are available through Belfast Whiskey Week, which is a, becoming available from tomorrow. So please do support that. 
other than that, Michael, any you anything you want to end on? Slancha, Slajava. Slanchava. Take care. <laughs> Thanks very much for being on. Yeah, good night, everybody. Good night. Now well, we kicked him out. We kept him on long enough. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that. It's a real character and part of the establishment of of Irish whiskey. And uh, next week we haven't announced yet who we're going to have next week. Like I said, we, in two weeks' time we do have the opportunity to speak with uh, Radham on the stage and uh, also Fiona O'Connor and talk about some of the innovative mash bills that they have produced. And we'll announce details on that. If you have enjoyed it, please do follow the channel. Uh, your support would be great. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care. Good night.